So hello everyone. It's my pride and honor to welcome you all to today's event, Infosys Prize Lecture on Mathematical Sciences, hosted jointly by the Infosys Science Foundation and the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. I extend my warm welcome to today's speaker, Professor Siddharth Bhatmishra of ETH Zurich. As you know, Professor Mishra was awarded the Infosys Prize in Mathematical Sciences for the year 2019 for his outstanding contribution to applied mathematics. Before we hear more about him, let me say a few lines about the Infosys Prize and the foundation. The Infosys Prize is an annual award established by the Infosys Science Foundation to honor outstanding achievements of researchers and scientists across six categories of sciences. Each prize carries a purse of a $100,000, a gold medal, and a citation. Today's talk is a part of the Infosys Prize lecture series, which are public talks delivered by the Infosys Prize laureates and jurors. The lecture series covers a wide range of topics on the cutting edge of science and research. They aim to inform the public and inspire young researchers and students to make their passion their profession. Indeed, Infosys Prime Science Foundation is playing an active role in shaping the future landscape of scientific research, especially in India. I did take this opportunity to thank all members of the foundation, the trustees and the ISF team for their selfless service. Now, without much ado, I invite Professor Bandhubathai, Director of ISI to introduce the speaker. After her introduction, we'll go straight into the talk and then I'll be back with the question and answer session. If you have any questions for Professor Mishra, please send us by tagging the Twitter handle at Infosys Prize, okay? At Infosys Prize, that's our Twitter handle. Over to you, Professor Bhambatra. Thank you, Rita Bruto. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Siddharth Mishra, our Infosys speaker of the day. Professor Shiddharth Mishra received an honors degree in mathematics and physics from Utkal University in Bhuvaneshwar in 2000. After his graduation, he joined the Applied Mathematics program run jointly by IISC and TIFR in Bengaluru. By 2005, he had earned both an MS and PhD degrees from both these places. Professor Mishra went to CMA at University of Oslo as a postdoc between 2005 and 2009, and followed it up with an assistant professorship at ETH Zurich, 2009 to 2011. He returned briefly to Oslo for a year, and then went back to Zurich in 2012 as an associate professor, and became a full professor in 2015. Professor Mishra is the recipient of many awards, such as the Richard von Mrs. Prize in 2015, the Jacques Louis Lyon Award in 2018, and the ICIAM Colats Prize in 2019. He was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians held in Rio de Janeiro in 2018. With those few words, I invite Professor Mishra to deliver his talk on computer simulations in the geosciences, current trends, and future directions. Over to you, Professor Mishra. Thank you very much, Professor Bondopadhyay, for this uh, nice introduction. And I take this opportunity first to thank uh, the Infosys Science Foundation and the entire team at the Infosys Science Foundation, particularly Nithi, for uh, organizing this event. And also, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rita Pratamunshi and his team at ISI Kolkata for hosting me today. I'm really pleased and honored to speak at this venue. So without further ado, I would like to start my talk by sharing my screen. You can, you can see my screen. And uh, so my talk will be on computer simulations in the geosciences. Uh, and geosciences is a very vast research area, uh, very vast area of science. So what I'm going to do is uh, in order to signify and in order to impress upon you, the significance of computer simulations in the geosciences, I picked two examples uh, close to my heart because I've worked on them. And let me start with that. So the first example, I couldn't be more topical, is the prediction of the global climate. As all of you know, yesterday, as it happened, this was completely fortuitous, 
Uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to three outstanding scientists, and one of them was Sikuro Manabe, originally from Japan, but who spent his entire professional career in the United States. Already in 1960s, Professor Manabe realized that the way to understand the global climate, and especially to predict it, requires to build computer models. And we remember in 1967, computers were uh, primitive, literally primitive, and did not have anywhere near the capacity that they have today. So they, they were literally not able to calculate much. Uh, anyway, Professor Manabe understood this. He was able to model the physical processes that underlie climate uh, dynamics into computer models. He was able to find algorithms to simulate these models. And he was one of the first to create what are called climate models, or climate modeling. And this will be my first example because it's very topical. It's also very important for all of us given the changes in the climate that we as humans have created. Right? So how is, uh, how, a cl how is climate modeling done? Okay, I'll give you a very brief primer. So the idea is that, uh, so directly I go to the equations. So essentially climate models, so global climate models today are called as earth system models because they model the atmosphere, they model the ocean, they model, you know, biology, they model quite a bit of chemistry, aerosols, and so on. So it's a very complex system. So it's called an earth system model. So today, earth system models, they look something like this. So at the heart of all these models are mathematical objects called partial differential equations. So I am not writing down the exact equation because this will fill up my entire space. Instead, I have a very abstract way of denoting them, an abstract notation for them. These equations are often called the primitive equations of uh, atmospheric and ocean dynamics. So the idea is that this capital U here is a vector of certain quantities, temperature, pressure, velocity, wind velocity, precipitation, rainfall, various other entropy, various um, tons and tons of variables. They're clubbed together into a single vector. And this is a function of space. It depends on where you're situated, how high you are in the atmosphere, how deep you are in the ocean and where you're located, which latitude, which longitude and so on. It of course depends on time because our climate uh, is changeable, keeps on changing. So this is a rate of change of this quantity with respect to time. And these quantities here are some notation abstract shorthand for some very complicated uh, spatial derivatives, uh, partial derivatives in space. So this A here stands for all kinds of nonlinear advective motions, uh, momentum transport, pressure transport, energy balance, and so on. So these are partial differential operators, which are sitting here. S is a so-called source term. So this tells you how much of carbon dioxide we are pumping into the atmosphere, how much of ozone is there, various kinds of source terms, uh, very complicated physics goes into it. If I start writing out these terms, this will one page would not be enough. I would need three, four slides just to write down these equations in the very basic form. So I don't even attempt to do that, right? And the last term, this is the one that I'm going to pay some special attention to, is what are called subscale, double S, parameterizations, but I'll talk about them in a minute. So remember, for our purposes, so we have partial differential equations, uh, which are written in this abstract notation. And these partial differential equations are nonlinear. They're fairly complicated. So you're never going to solve them by hand. So in order to predict, in order to understand the climate, we have to solve them on a computer. You have to build a computer model, like what Professor Manabe did. And today, one can say that uh, this is now 50 years old, right? They started in the 1960s and we are in 2021. So 60 years old almost. And lots of progress has been made. I'm not going into all the details here, but just some keywords. So first of all, instead of having the entire sphere, the globe and so the atmosphere, what you do is you put things on a grid. So the grid typically has latitude, longitude. You also discretize along the vertical direction. Then all these uh, partial derivatives, the uh, time derivative, the spatial derivatives, they're discretized. So they're replaced either by finite differences or some finite elements. Uh, either, either approach is viable or finite volumes, uh, which is also a very popular form of discretization. And there are many other complicated objects. So, so for instance, there is uh, time stepping. So the time derivative is discretized by what is called a semi-Lagrangian scheme. Some of these elements I'm going to spell out later. And there are many, many complicated things. This is a very rich topic and it requires two full courses at ETH, for instance, to teach this to students. 
So what I'm going to focus on instead is uh, the role played by what are called subscale parameterizations. So this will be my main focus. These terms, let's say that there are good discretizations available, even if there are still quite a bit of challenges at the algorithmic level. So what are these uh, subscale discretizations or parameterizations? So the idea is the following. I have a cartoon to represent this. So remember that we have this uh, system of PDEs out here, and this is just a cartoon, right? Uh, so remember that we have uh, the earth as a sphere, and of course there's atmosphere, so there are layers on top of it. And then things happen at different scales, physical scales in terms of time as well as space. So the resolution of your grid, uh, the resolution at which we can numerically represent what's going on is of a certain order. It could be hundreds of kilometers or it could be at best tens of kilometers, but it's typically 100 to 1000 kilometers. So that's, that's, that's quite, quite a long distance. So think of it, this is where we are simulating. So the computer only sees this, this grid here, but the physical processes that underlie our atmosphere and our oceans they're happening at all kinds of scales, not just at atmospheric scales, but they're also happening in tens of kilometers, clouds, for instance, one kilometer, 100 meters, one meter, one centimeter, aerosols, you know, so all kinds of different scales are being represented. So for our purposes, let's imagine that the dynamics on a computer, the computer or algorithm only sees this. Uh, so let's say the volumes at this scale, but as the physical processes are happening at much finer scales, let's say along the scales of these little triangles. So what is happening here has to be represented here, right? And this cannot be done algorithmically directly, but rather it, has, it is done in some sort of an implicit manner through this subgrid scale parameterizations. So we do some local simulations, solve what is happening here, and then project on the result, the influence on this bigger scale, and then the entire thing is solved in one book. So this is the role of implicit parameterizations that you solve for small scales separately and somehow model these scales at a higher level. So this is, this is roughly what is going to happen. And this sub, subgrid scale parameterizations are the biggest challenge when it comes to climate modeling, at least in my subjective opinion. And what I'm going to focus today, and there are different kinds of subgrid scale parameterizations for aerosols, for and these are very important for water vapor, for various things. What I'm going to focus on is a particular kind of subgrid scale parameterization, which concerns clouds, okay? And not any clouds, you know, clouds also have varieties. So I'm going to focus on one particular class of clouds, which are very important. These are the so-called stratocumulus clouds. So this is a picture of it. And the best way to see these clouds is when you fly. So when you fly and you look down, this is more difficult in India, it's easier in North America and Europe. You look down and you see this low flaky clouds, white clouds, and these are precisely the stratocumulus clouds. These are white clouds, so they are very good at reflecting. So this is, uh, they have good albedo. So the point about these clouds is that, uh, first of all, as I said, these are clouds which are from an altitude of one kilometer to roughly two and a half kilometers. They're very important cloud type, what are called boundary layer cloud type. This is where the atmospheric boundary layer starts, roughly speaking. And these clouds are unbelievably complicated. First of all, they themselves have a range of scales. So this, uh, the cloud itself could be in the scale of kilometers, 10 kilometers. However, the process that underlie it could be at uh, centimeters, meters, and so on. It has a very strong velocity gradients. That's why they flow quite fast. And of course, needless to say, this flow is uh, turbulent. If you look at clouds, you'll see that all kinds of scales are there, all kinds of patterns are there. So it is turbulent. And what is unbelievably complicated is the thermodynamics, how the pressure, the entropy, and the temperature are related to each other. To figure that out requires a PhD. So this is really, really complicated. So, okay, they have very complicated physics, but why should you care about them in the first place? One reason why you should care about them is that they have a very strong climate change feedback. And I'm taking out a quote from this paper here, which says that 15 to 20% change in the coverage of these clouds can, because these are white clouds, so this can offset global warming due to doubling of the CO2 concentration. Can you believe that? So I double the CO2 concentration. And if 20% of this, uh, there's an increase, then you could, uh, for instance, offset this effect. So they have such strong feedback on climate. So of course, we don't know this a priori, right? We don't know if you increase the carbon dioxide concentration, whether these clouds are increased. In that case, that's good because that will be a negative feedback, a check on global warming. 
or if these clouds are decreased, then it's horrible, then it's positive feedback, right? Then uh, the more carbon dioxide we pump out into the atmosphere, more cloud cover is destroyed, even more warming happens and this keeps on, uh, this is a positive feedback. So both negative and positive feedbacks are, or negative feedback, sorry, and the other was a positive feedback. So because of this uncertainty, so we don't know more carbon dioxide, does it lead to more stratocumulus or less stratocumulus? This is still an open question, or to some extent an open question. So that's why this uh, climate predictions, there is uncertainty there. Even though climate scientists sometimes uh, brush it over because the uncertainty, then some people say, okay, why should we do anything? Maybe the earth is not heating up. But the point is that there is no direction to the uncertainty. It might uh, heat up even more, right? Instead of two degrees, it could be two and a half degrees. You never know. So there is a source of uncertainty and these clouds are the fundamental source of uncertainty. Our understanding of these clouds is behind this uncertainty. So one way to tackle this is to build better computer models to predict what happens to these clouds based on different scenarios. If you have more carbon dioxide, what happens to these clouds? Less carbon dioxide, what happens to these clouds? So now, how do we model this? Now here, I need to go a little bit into details. Otherwise, uh, the, the significance is lost a bit. Again, for those who are um, not mathematically oriented, it uh, doesn't matter. Just try to follow the sort of uh, argument. So essentially, as I said, as always in physics, underlying, if you want to build up models of these things, these end up being partial differential equations. And this is more or less the only partial differential equation that I'm going to write out. Uh, so this is for this stratocumulus clouds, the dynamics of the stratocumulus clouds. And again, the variables here are the density, which is something which is known here, so it doesn't change. But the velocity here, uh, velocity field, and then you have uh, entropy, you have uh, humidity, and many other variables. You could put in precipitation, snow, and so on and so forth. These will be what are called active scalars. So anyway, so the change of the velocity, for instance, so we know from school, change of velocity is acceleration. Acceleration by Newton's law equals force. The forces here are due to pressure and also due to buoyancy and other, other effects. Okay, there are some other effects. And this is what is called advective derivatives. So you have some nonlinear interaction here, nonlinear transport. Your flow is incompressible. So you get this sort of a continuity of Bernoulli's equation. And there are entropy and temperature and uh, water vapor and so on. These are all advected with the flow. Of course, they also affect the flow in a very nonlinear manner. So there are all kinds of feedbacks and feed forwards here, which I'm not going to spell out. So these are all contained here. So the basic thing is that there is a nonlinear partial differential equation, systems of nonlinear partial differential equations. And this is what we have to solve on a computer. And this you don't, because this is done locally, you don't have to solve it at the level of the whole globe. So you can look at it in a box. Okay, so the way we do it at the moment, as I said, uh, there are feedbacks on small scales. A very important uh, feedback here is uh, through turbulence because the motion of these clouds is turbulent. So again, the key terms here are what are called eddy viscosity and eddy diffusivity. The details are not important. The important point here is that these terms are nonlinear. So this uh, S here is a first order partial derivative. And then you take an absolute value of this and you take a divergence of this. So this is a second order complicated partial derivative and there is some um, mesh size, you know, there are, there are some constants here that need to be determined. So needless to say, the system is fairly complicated. There are lots of non-dimensional parameters that are going to change the sort of dynamics of the system based on where you are. So it's a complicated computer model or a computer complicated physical model. And the way it is done is at least it was done, let's say five years ago, and there are many different codes, for instance, the Dutch atmospheric large eddy simulation or the WARF code, which is from the US and so on. So there are details are described here. We had Cartesian grids, but these were anisotropic. We had what are called staggered grids. And essentially the idea is that you always replace this partial derivatives. So these are continuous objects. Uh, you cannot put them on a computer by finite differences, some smart way of finite differences because finite differences you can compute, you can put them on a computer. You can write algorithm. So these are some very sophisticated finite differences that I don't need to describe here in, in any detail. So this was all done very cleverly. It was not done naively, it was done very cleverly. And then people tried to do some benchmark tests. So, you know, you have to do some benchmark tests. And here's an example of a benchmark test. So this is a part of the Pacific, just uh, off the coast of Los Angeles. 
And then you see uh, cloud cover, or this model gave you a cloud cover, which looks something like this. So not, not a lot of cloud, right? However, we have measurements for this. So they ran a measurement campaign and there were planes which are flying in, trying to measure the cloud cover and trying to image it. So what is the image? So this is where we stand, okay? So these are the, let's say, predictions from one of the codes. And this is what the cloud cover looks like from the plane. So you can see that it's completely covered here, whereas what our numerical simulation gave is completely wrong. So this is the, there is complete mismatch between the numerical simulation and between the cloud cover. And you see that in quantitative things. So these are different numerical schemes. So remember the cloud cover is almost one. So it's uh, this particular setting, this particular time snapshot, the cloud cover is almost going to be one. So it's uh, the whole place is covered in clouds. On the other hand, so what was acceptable to them was a 10% error. So 90% uh, cloud cover would have been fine, but these guys, they were completely wrong. So even though the initial data was measured from the measurements, however, what happened is that the cloud cover just went down and down and down. And at the end of it, uh, almost nothing remained. So this was, um, and this was uh, very problematic, right? Because if these clouds are <laughs> not uh, correctly computed, then you get all kinds of wrong feedbacks into your global uh, earth systems model. So it was exactly around this time when the, the groups which were looking at it, uh, this is a group based in Caltech. The, okay, here's another example of a measurement. So this is the measurement of the, what is called the liquid water specific humidity. You can measure the amount of water vapor. And this is a, sort of a, lat, a longitudinal measurement. So you go with respect to the height and look at the liquid water you have a few data points and you can see that uh, these are the data points, but this is what your numerical simulation gave, which is completely a mismatch. So this was, this was a big problem. And this is exactly the time when a group at Caltech, uh, they contacted me and we started working on the problem. And now I use my experience and expertise as a mathematician, I'm a mathematician to say that, okay, if we start with this very complicated model, uh, this is already too complicated. It's difficult to write down, you know, analysis of this model and we have to start with something simple. So the first step is always to, to build good algorithms is to look at toy models. So something which uh, somehow has the spirit of the equations, while at the same time doesn't have all the, let's say, detail, the fluff. And we could come out with a very simple model. The details are not important, but this model looks much more short, right? It more, looks much more concise. So you have momentum transport, which is nonlinear. You have the continuity equation, uh, incompressibility as it is called, and you have some transport by the velocity. So this is a very simple model. And uh, the point is, remember that in a computer, you cannot write down partial derivatives. You have to replace them with finite differences. So what we're able to do is uh, to understand this, we're able to write what are called equivalent equations. So we are trying to say that our computer model does not approximate this, it does approximate this, but it approximates another model much more accurately, which model is a perturbation of this model. So those who know perturbation theory in physics, this is a form of perturbation theory. So this is the sort of nonlinear perturbations here. So our numerical method, our algorithm looks much more like this rather than like this. So you still have the partial derivatives, but because we have finite grids, our finite size, you have some complicated terms on the right hand side and the order of the scheme is written here. So this was the first step because it's a tractable model. We could write this down rigorously. If it was much more sort of elaborate physical model, it would not be humanly possible to do so. Once it is there, then we can go back to mathematical analysis or basic physics, depending on your perspective. And we look at what is called the kinetic energy balance. So kinetic energy is something that is, uh, should be ideally conserved, or if it is dissipated, it should be dissipated, uh, let's say broken down by very precise physical mechanisms. And uh, the equation looks something like this. But the point is from this analysis, we realize that uh, numerical methods are not completely accurate. They're, they're, not, they're, they're approximations. And the way we were doing the schemes, we would always have some oscillations. Uh, we could not avoid these oscillations. This required uh, diving into turbulence theory and some numerical analysis, rigorous mathematical analysis. And we are able to compute that uh, the approximation will be inaccurate in the sense that there will be some spurious numerical oscillations for the velocity field at a certain scale. Okay, small, but at a certain scale. Because of these uh, small numerical oscillations, we could go back to, we'll do some more analysis. We could go back to the sort of energy balance 
And then we were able to derive a very precise relationship for the dissipation of the energy corresponding to the scalar quantity. For instance, it could be the cloud cover, it could be the um, uh, specific entropy and uh, liquid water humidity and so on. And what we were able to identify is a mechanism by which this numerical methods were not working. So what was happening is that there were spurious oscillations in the momentum equation. So this was a momentum equation. There were some spurious oscillations here, small, but they were there. And because of that, you had a lot of diffusion, a lot of dissipation in the equation for the scalar. So the equation for the scalar is here. So something going wrong slightly here was through nonlinear feedbacks causing a big problem here. In particular, it was causing a lot of diffusion. So all the energy was getting lost. That's why the cloud cover was getting destroyed. Something like this was happening. So this was a very precise, uh, let's say process or uh, formulation by which we are able to recover what was going wrong. Because we are able to recover what was going wrong by doing all this numerical analysis, we are able to correct it, right? Once you, you know what's going wrong, you can always correct it. And this was done by, again, there are a lot of details that I'm not going to speak about, but essentially we just cut out what is uh, conventional wisdom in the field, which is add eddy viscosity and eddy diffusivity. But these were exactly the things that were causing problems for us. So we just cut it out. And we added what is called, we did what is called an implicit large eddy simulation. This is just a fancy term, but essentially identify the problem terms, take them out and just keep it clean. You know, as a consequence, what we saw was that uh, the energy dissipation, which is earlier order one. So it was always going down, whether you have a fine grid or a coarse grid, you would have a lot of energy dissipation and the cloud cover would be destroyed. Now what happened is that it depended on the grid as it should. So if you have a fine grid, then you don't have a lot of dissipation. The cloud cover is going to be retained. But this was all done at the level of a model problem. Can we scale it to the real problem, right? So this uh, the analysis can't be scaled because it's very complicated, but we can do numerical experiments and see if this really works out in the code. And this was indeed done. So remember, this is the situation that we're going to represent. Uh, we failed abysmally before, but with all this analysis and these corrections, can we, with this new algorithm, can we do this? And the answer is, this is what you get. Much better, right? In fact, uh, let me, this is a good point to show you a video because uh, you can see how the cloud dynamics changes. So you can see here. So now the same thing is dynamically evolving. It's no longer static, it is dynamically evolving. And you can see that this is, you can see the cloud through this liquid water path. And you can see that this is a very complicated uh, evolution. You can never write down a formula for this. There are lots of different scales, lots of turbulent motion. It looks beautiful, but more importantly, it's not getting diffused out. Uh, there is there is enough content here, and there is uh, plenty of cloud cover. With uh, you can see that the dynamics is fairly fairly sophisticated, right? Uh, but it's all done because we are able to identify the problem with classical numerical algorithms, and we were able to fix it. And the movie goes on because we are constantly forcing it. Anyway, so this was about the movie, and you could see that there was this. Uh, uh, let's say fix. Uh, so we were now able to get more correct results, but let's do some quantitative results because this is still qualitative. It looks good on the eye, but does it uh, really work in practice? And the answer is it does. So remember that uh, the cloud cover is almost one. Earlier we were like at 40%. Now with our schemes, these are different variants, you get almost one. So this is almost a perfect match. Uh, in fact, surprisingly good. And with this uh, liquid water specific humidity, you can see the data here. Again, uh, this is a perfect match. It hits the data completely correctly. So this was, uh, this was very nice. Uh, these are different kinds of other quantities. You know, you are uh, climate scientists, they want to measure various things. They want to measure liquid water path. They want to measure the variance of the, some moments here through time averaging, because you know, each, each realization, you could see how chaotic it was. So you have to look at statistics, so this was the state of the art before. Um, it was completely missing these points. Uh, then with the corrections, uh, people had already corrected it. This was the state of the art before we came out with the algorithm. And this is what, so this was a baseline, which was very bad. This was corrections, uh, get better here, but missing the point here completely. And this is with our algorithm. You know, you start getting a lot, lot of the content. Of course, you are a bit off here, but this is because of uncertainties in this model. So you can't recover every measurement correctly. And this was an even harder thing. This is the skewness, the third moment, right? And uh, this is even harder to compute. And you know, it was even missing the tilt, the baseline. Then with, uh, sorry, 
with the corrections, you start getting it better, but you're still missing this. And with our algorithm, we got the entire thing uh, better. You know, so the, even the statistics were coming correctly. So at least this particular kind of cloud parameterization, we, we were able to somehow solve it. And in fact, this uh, piece of work is already operational in a few GCMs. And in particular, my collaborators at Caltech, they're coming out with a new earth system model. So the entire called Clima, and there they are going to, they, are, they have already incorporated it. This is not yet released. There are many, many different issues uh, that have to be fixed. But it will be, I think uh, it will be released soon. And then this will be the go-to uh, Earth system model, hopefully. I know it's not my thing, so I, I, can't, I can't give any guarantees. However, so this was just a small glimpse of the kind of work that Sukuro Manabe started, but now models are getting more and more complicated and able to really capture what's happening out there, right? Uh, however, there are many issues. You know, this is never a solved problem. There are many issues. I think I have approximately 10 minutes and I will try 10, 12 minutes and I'll try to sort of uh, go through at least some of these issues. And one of these issues are uncertainties. You know, so there are, you, you make measurements, right? And these measurements are never certain. There are always going to be uncertainties. So when we say, for instance, we had a good match, uh, we, we are not giving you confidence bounds for the measurements. So these measurements are going to be uncertain. There's so many uncertainties. How does one cope with the uncertainties? This is a big issue. They're also expensive. And the biggest issue to my mind is computational cost. You know, it's very, very expensive. The simulations that I showed you are, let's say, small scale. These are three-dimensional, but small scale. However, a full Earth system model is very, very expensive. So to do statistics, to do scenario exploration, this is uh, at the moment uh, out of bounds. But it consumes a lot of computing power, at least in the classical paradigm. So can we do something about these two things? So of course, uh, this has not yet been done for climate models, at least for the full earth system models, but it is done for let's say phenomena, which are uh, slightly easier to understand, or significantly easier to understand. And this is my second example. I change perspective a bit because in these cases, uh, these issues are to some extent solved and they'll give you, give you lessons about what to do with climate models. So let me show you this beautiful picture. So this beautiful picture, a black and white picture, grayscale, is from a place called Lituya Bay in Alaska. Um, why do I care? It's, a, it's rugged, a beautiful landscape, but who cares about this? Well, why we should care is because uh, something momentous really happened here. So on the 9th of July, 1958, quite a few years back, there was a big earthquake, you know, Alaska is full of earthquakes. So this was a magnitude eight earthquake. And because of the earthquake, there was a huge rock slide. You know, this was like 30 million cubic meters of rock that fell down on this little bay here. And because it fell down on the bay, you can, you can imagine that it generated a huge tsunami. And it was not any tsunami. First of all, the, it had a huge runoff height of 525 meters. But essentially, they were able to compute or calculate the wave height because there were two uh, father-son uh, duo who were fishing here. And the wave height here is almost 100 meters. So just imagine a wave, which is 100 meters. So this is the most powerful or at least the tallest tsunami that was ever recorded. And so powerful that you can see this is a cross section of the forest on the other side of the bay, on this side of the bay. And you can see that uh, up to here, up to 525 meters, all the trees are smashed. But down here also, there is a significant um, significant uh, destruction of the vegetation, but here everything is smashed. The question is, can we ever model, can we ever simulate such extreme phenomena? Answer is surprisingly well, yes. And again, the trick is first you have to model, right? Someone has to model all the physics that is there in this phenomena. So there is water and there is rock. So you get some partial differential equations again, nonlinear and complicated ones. Uh, let's and these were two Swiss people, Sava and Hutter, who did this. So this is a two-phase flow. I'm not going to spend more time on it. Uh, and the point is, what we are going to do is we are going to do simulations of this based on uh, finite volume methods. And the simulations, uh, maybe I'll show you a movie because I have a nice movie, so you can look at the simulation um, of this. Uh, we did the simulation. Yeah, you see there's a rock slide, it generates a tsunami. Red is high, high waves. Uh, blue is uh, negative high. So you can see perhaps the beginning is what is the most impressive. Okay, so remember, boom, it comes, there's a big wave which is generated, runs up here, runs down along the bay and so on. 
So it looks very pretty, right? And it looks very impressive. These are very, very large waves. You can't, uh, so this goes all the way up to 100 here. Maybe I should have used this. Okay, we are stopping at 40 because you have to stop somewhere, but uh, it goes all the way to 100 here. So let me show you a snapshot of this. Now I've lost my PDF file uh, quickly. Okay, so you can see that it goes all the way up to 100 here. So these are very, very tall waves and they go high up. So it seems like this is consistent with what, uh, what we believed uh, to have happened on that event. However, all this is uh, in a way useless. Why is this useless? Because of inputs, you know? So in this models, we had several parameters, uh, just like in the climate model, we have several parameters, we have several parameters, layer density ratio, Coulomb friction, bottom friction, and so on. The point is these parameters, even in the lab, when you make measurements of these parameters, these are very, very difficult to measure. They're so difficult to measure that the noise to signal ratio is almost one. The standard deviation is like the mean, so yeah. So it could be just a lucky shot that we got this and in another uh, simulation, we could get something else. So, and this is very common in science, right? That the measurements are uncertain and we have to somehow take into account, uh, quantify the uncertainty also in our simulations. And this is easier said than done. Okay, so this was just the explanation of what happens. Uh, even for climate models, you know, they can be written in this form, but initial conditions are uncertain, source terms are uncertain, coefficients are uncertain. So we have to do this uncertainty quantification. And in my group, we have what is called uh, multi-level Monte Carlo method. Uh, this is not a forum to explain what this method is, but it's a sophisticated variant of the classical Monte Carlo method. And with that, we can do some uncertainty quantification. So this is a lab experiment by Fritz et al, who did, uh, who did the same uh, tsunami, but in a lab, right? So a scale model. And they were able to sort of, and this is their experimental data, and this is our simulation, but now with the uncertainty. So what is important is this uh, wave here. So we were able to, with the uncertainty, so you can see that we have the mean of the run-up and we have some standard deviation here. We are very well able to approximate in the leading edge of the wave. We are very well able to approximate, um, approximate the wave here, so even the experimental data. Of course, we were not so good here. There's some dispersion error that we were not able to capture, but this is because of inadequate modeling. The equations that we have are only valid in this region. They're not so much valid in this region. So if you look at the look at the pictures here, so this is no longer the it's just a mean. It's no longer one single realization. It's a mean computed through this fancy method, and the mean is uh, 100 meters here, right? But as I said, the, the key is what is the variance, and here is the variance. You see, at the same place where the mean is 100, the variance is tiny. So even if there's a lot of input uncertainty here. Because of the nonlinearities in the problem, uh, which we are able to compute, uh, the output uncertainty is very low. So that one simulation would have been fine because th there is not a lot of variance. But it's good to know this, right? This need not necessarily be the case. And similarly, we can do this on um, earthquake-generated tsunamis. Uh, again, there are uncertainties here because you have an earthquake. And when you have an earthquake, uh, the seafloor gets deformed. And because of that, there is a little perturbation in your sea floor, sea, um, you know, the, top, the, the water height. And because, and this model is called the Okada model. It has lots of parameters that are uncertain. And we have done some uncertainty quantification. Let me show you the example here. So we have an earthquake, which happens off the coast of Crete in the Mediterranean. This uh, sends out tsunami waves. And this is going to be the mean uh, after two hours. And this is going to be the variance. So this tells you that this is a very accurate simulation because the variance is rather low. It is uh, what people are really interested, my collaborators are really interested is what happens here because they come from Italy. So they are from Italian agency and we see that we have almost no variance here. So this is, uh, this is very good. There's a lot of variance around North Africa because the measurements here are very imprecise. And the same thing happens uh, at four hours, the tsunami is very complicated. Similar things happen in the Indian Ocean, right? And uh, as you can see, there is uh, some diffraction here. And again, the variance is concentrated along the North African coast. So after the uncertainty quantification, you can say for certain that this is what is happening. So this is here, this is a two-dimensional model. The equations are much less complicated. There's less physics than the Earth system model. Nevertheless, uh, this is also not, not super easy. So with the most sophisticated code, lots of GPUs that we have today, the whole thing here took 90 minutes. Now, you know, when you do this in 90 minutes, then uh, you're going to issue a tsunami warning, right? And people have to evacuate and so on, 90 minutes is too long. 
you really have to do it in less than a minute. And this is, this is a challenge to reduce the cost by two orders of magnitude. In the climate simulations, this would be something like, while still being accurate, in climate simulations, this would be something like three, four orders of magnitude if possible. So these days, this can be done and uh, in many problems. And the reason why it can be done is because we have suddenly found uh, one magic wand with which many of these problems can be addressed. And these are deep neural networks, machine learning. Uh, maybe very quickly, so what are deep neural networks? These are very powerful these days in all kinds of applications. Uh, um, machine translation, your YouTube recommendations, uh, self-driving cars, uh, facial recognition, but they are also slowly revolutionizing scientific computing because they're very, very powerful at approximating things. Uh, and what are these objects? These are mathematical objects, deep neural networks. They are modeled by, or they're inspired by what happens in the brain, but they don't have a lot of correspondence. They're really mathematical objects. These are compositions of uh, functions, uh, linear functions, affine functions, followed by scalar nonlinearities. And then you do some training, you solve a complicated non-convex optimization problem. Many of you know this these days, but you, you can apply this to scientific computing. However, this is not easy at all. You can't just use a black box because our maps are very, very complicated and we don't have a lot of data because simulations are expensive. So in my group, we have different solutions for this. For instance, we use something called low discrepancy sequences at training time. We do many other tricks and we were able to solve this problem of, uh, to some extent at least, to, to an error of 1% with a computing time less than 30 seconds. So earlier it was like 90 minutes, now it's 30 seconds. So we have this two, three orders of magnitude and you can see this, uh, this, this is some snapshots uh, off the coast of Italy. We are just looking at the wave as a time series. Uh, here, for instance, it's almost accurate, uh, exactly. You can't distinguish what the machine learning gives from the computer simulation, the full computer simulation. And this is our worst result. You know, this is off the coast of Calabria for this particular configuration. And you can see that we are still quite accurate. Uh, There's a fairly complicated time series that we have been able to accurately learn. So machine learning provides some sort of a, let's say, way out from this cost dilemma because we have huge costs, but a lot, lot needs to be done. So now my whole point was that I gave you two examples, but uh, two or three is at least uh, quite a lot, but I didn't have the time for this. So the, uh, nowadays computer simulations can simulate real world problems. And in fact, are the main angle of attack that we have in addressing some of these real world problems. I gave you two examples, but uh, there are many open issues. The big thing is the cost and uncertainty. So here I believe, and I am actively working on it, that machine learning algorithms are the key because they can provide you to explore scenarios. What happens if the carbon dioxide concentration is half as much as we expected it or one third, and you can do quantitative things at very low cost. And hopefully uh, we can replace all these finite difference, finite element methods that we have today with machine learning algorithms, but that's for another lecture. Um, today, I think I'm going to stop here. So thank you very much for your attention and I, I'm happy to answer questions. So shall I just uh, stop my sh stop sharing my screen or what should I do, Ajay? I'm, I'm done with my lecture now. Yes, sir. Should I stop sharing my screen? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Shidharth, for your wonderful stimulating talk. So I have a few questions from the audience that uh, I'm going to ask you now. So the first one says, uh, computer simulations can provide students with the opportunity to enhance their understanding of geologic process by changing input parameters for simulations and observing the effects on the output. However, effective use of simulations requires an understanding of their limitations as well. Could you elaborate on this aspect? Sita? Absolutely, that's uh, that's a fundamental point, right? That's why we do numer. That's my primary calling. I'm a numerical analyst. Our whole uh, <laughs> rise on the tray of existence is to understand algorithms, and in particular, to understand the limitations. So there are two ways to understand the limitations. One is that you run an algorithm, you have some data, for instance, experiments, measurements, observations and you see your algorithm doesn't match the data. So something must be wrong, right? So this was the example that I gave you with respect to the cloud uh, simulations. But 
why that happens requires uh, this is uh, data is alone not going to explain that for that you really need to understand what a numerical algorithm does and for that, you also need to understand what the underlying model does. So models are typically PDEs. So you need to know a little bit about PDEs and you need to know about numerical algorithms because what we do in numerical algorithms is we try to replicate the physical process to some extent. So there are conservation laws like, you know, second law of thermodynamics, energy balance, which is what I tried to show you. You have to replicate these things. If you don't, your algorithm is not a very good algorithm. If you do, there's a very high probability that your algorithm is going to be good. So understanding the limitations comes from understanding the algorithm itself. And to design the algorithm, you need to have some insight into the system. You need to have some insight into the mathematics of the system. So indeed, this is a, this is a very, very val valid point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the second question is, uh, do current climate models naturally balance energy at the top of the atmosphere? Or is this something which is imposed for the pre-industrial period? Uh, this is a technical issue. I think different models, uh, I think different models have different um, ways to do it. And this can always be changed. You know, this is very sort of a specific question that is very model specific. And this can easily be changed because people, I think, from my perspective, it would be nice to always have the right energy balance, right? But I know that many models that tune this because they want to get observations correct. I don't like it, but I'm not a climate model. I'm a numerical analyst, so I don't like it, but they, they, they seem to use it because they want to get the pre-industrial or some 19th century observations, 20th century observations correctly. So there's a lot of tuning which takes place because we have so many uncertain parameters. So there is, there is no choice, right? So nowadays the effect is, or at least the trend is that uh, instead of having some model out there with a hundred parameters and then trying to fit all the parameters to data, let's try to be as much faithful to the physics as possible and to have, try to have as less parameters as possible, for instance, by increasing resolution, by using what are called multi-resolution methods, uh, and then finally having a few parameters that and trying to impose as much of the physical loss as possible, finally having a few parameters that necessarily be tuned, but possibly in a Bayesian manner. So get as much of the physics correct, instead of say, trying to fit the data as much as possible, then we don't know whether this is going to extrapolate or not. I mean, what is happening in the 20th century did not happen in the 21st century. So this is a good question. And I say that different groups have different choices, but my own personal opinion is to be as faithful to the physics as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the third question is, uh, are there any tools or software out there that you can recommend for measuring the impact of carbon reduction or sustainability efforts in general? Offhand, I don't know, but I, I'm sure that there are tools because I have seen that uh, there are tools, but these are, um, I think the full models are never made available in these tools because these are, so what, what this person is probably asking is, is it available to a domain scientist or is it available to a general public? Of course, it is available to domain scientists because there are different climate models and they have frequently changed this. Is this available to a general public? Uh, an individual wants to see if the... I don't know this, to be honest. Probably not because that would... You know, there are always caveats. If you, if you have this sort of uh, calculators, maybe out there, there are some calculators, but then... This is, uh, I, I think this is a dangerous game to play because uh, if, if everyone starts sort of fiddling around with models, fiddling around with carbon dioxide concentrations, see what happens. You know, there are so many uncertainties that a domain expert is best uh, suited to judge this. If you're all becoming, um, if you're all becoming climate modelers, then I think this is a, this is a dangerous situation. So I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend that. Even if there are tools, they should always be taken with a pinch of salt. Okay, thank you. So finally, I'm just going to ask a very silly question. It's just from me. It's yeah, uh, yeah it's from the pure mathematician. As you know, I do number theory. So I, yes, yes. So the question is, uh, what do you think uh, can a pure mathematician do in this field of uh, deep learning or artificial intelligence? 
and what can pure mathematicians get from machine learning and artificial intelligence? Okay, this is a very, very good question. I mean, uh, first of all, are pure mathematicians interested is always, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Now, so, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence is, uh, first of all, let's say machine learning, because artificial intelligence is much bigger than that, right? Because then the cognitive neuroscience comes in and so on and so forth. But just in machine learning, there are many, many, many open questions. Mm, means many, many open questions. And uh, I try to address this myself. Uh, but for instance, what pure mathematicians can certainly contribute, you know, essentially what we're trying to solve is uh, optimize, let's say one, one specific question is, we're trying to solve an optimization problem uh, corresponding to functions, which are of a very clear hypothesis class. You know, these are essentially compositions. These are not polynomials because then it would have been a question on algebraic geometry, but uh, uh, polynomials uh, are not, not included, but these are very, let's say these are linear functions with some simple nonlinearities, linear functions, simple nonlinearities. So there, there is a, there's a distinctive structure to that. But the point is what you end up is an optimization problem uh, in 10 million dimensions, you know, or in 20 million dimensions. So the geometry of this uh, optimization problem of this optimization landscape is going to be very, very important. And I think pure mathematicians are so high dimensional, very high dimensional geometry. Is this the same as 20 dimensional geometry as 50 dimensional geometry? Is geometry the same in 10,000 dimensions? These are questions that pure mathematicians, particularly geometers are very, very well equipped to un understand. There's something uh, I see it in my own work, you know? So sometimes to approximate something in five dimensions, uh, it's the same function uh, or the same situation in five dimensions is hard, but in 50 dimensions is easier. You know, why does that happen? What, what is it? Uh, there are things with probability theory, concentration of measure and so on that are, uh, that are germane here. But I think geometry is very important in this. Another thing that could be very important would be topology because uh, nowadays there is a field called topological data analysis, also topological algebraic geometry, where they look at uh, data as uh, topological objects and they try to understand topological patterns in it. I, mean, so I am not uh, by any means qualified to understand what's going on here. I think something good is going to come out of it, but it's unclear at the moment. At the moment, uh, people have not been able to scale this. And uh, uh, at the moment, you know, the math, math that goes into machine learning is, uh, you know, mostly probability theory, statistics, uh, partial differential equations, numerical analysis, uh, which are more like applied math uh, topics, which go there. Pure math topics, I think, have a role. Maybe at the end of it, it's a question, pure question, a question in pure math. But at the moment, it has not made any impact. This is, this is true. But maybe this is because pure mathematicians are not asking the right questions. This, uh, this could very well be the case. But I think there is, uh, there is plenty of, um, there are groups which are looking into it from algebraic geometry, from algebraic topology, trying to find patterns. I don't really see a breakthrough coming from them yet, but it has to come, right? Because this is uh, something, something is happening, which is, uh, which is in very high dimensions, which has complicated geometry. And if I, saw, if I visualize some of these lost surfaces, they look very, very, <laughs> very, very complicated. But uh, this is beyond my paycheck to predict uh, what kind of pure mathematics is going to play a role. But I'm sure something will. <laughs> Thank you, Siddharth. And yeah, as Einstein once said that, uh, you know, pure mathematicians can do a lot of things but never the thing that you want them to do at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, when, so I, when, I, yeah. when I talk to my colleagues here, including former Infosys Prize or other Infosys Prize laureates who are down the hall, uh, and I ask them these questions, they, they, they're not super interested. You know, one, has to, one has to probably come out with much more concrete uh, questions, then people will get interested. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, so finally, and uh, so what is your reaction to the recent announcement of Nobel Prize 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a this is a very very good question, and it's really sort of for tweeters, right? I <laughs> so I, I'm thrilled with it uh, for two reasons. First of all, uh, one of the laureates is uh, Giorgio Parisi, who has been sort of a scientific inspiration for me ever since I was in graduate school. You know, I I, I read his book on phase transitions on on uh, the KPC equations and. I am I'm, I'm fascinated personally by disordered systems. I, I do algorithms, but my real calling is, or my interest is in understanding complex systems. And Parisi's understanding of complex systems uh, is at a different level. He has led us to a different level in understanding. So that was very, very well deserved. Second is this uh, award to Manabe and to, uh, of course, some people have died. Arakawa, for instance, was a co-worker of Manabe. He, I think, uh, uh, some, but you have to choose some people. But I think this was such a, such a good choice that it's, uh, and also it's uh, in a long, long time, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics goes to people who do what is called classical physics, right? It's not quantum, it's not big astrophysics uh, <laughs> at uh, cosmic scales, it's not at the smallest scales that you can imagine, but at human scales, because at human scales is where the problems are. And, you know, there are so many problems, the physical understanding of this is not at all done, right? If it would have done, then uh, we would have understood how the climate is going to behave in <laughs> 100 years. It is not, right? So there's a lot of beautiful physics that is necessary and this interaction between physical understanding and writing the math, uh, the models, uh, this, this comes from, from a physicist, right? And then computer simulations, this is, uh, I think this will hopefully inspire young people who want to do physics and math, who end up doing, let's say, uh, super string theory and so on, which is also very important, but it, this will give them another choice, right? Uh, they can do something that is, uh, that is uh, important to us here and now which is also, and you know, there are questions uh, to solve the climate crisis. We have to build better, you know, energy systems, but we have to suck out the carbon from the atmosphere. This requires carbon dioxide sequestration, or we have to do some geoengineering. We have to put some, you know, sulfate particles or some aerosols. And then how, how is this going to change the climate? How is it going to, will it lead to heating? Will it lead to local cooling? There's so many questions that uh, the physics and the math and the numerics needs to be done. And we in India, I'm not sitting in India now, but I'm very much an Indian. We, we are going to be most affected by climate change. You know, I saw a report yesterday that India will have the population, the biggest population of people will be subjected to heat shocks. So we have a stake in it. And uh, we as Indians have, uh, we should encourage people to go and work in these fields to come out with novel solutions because this problem has to be solved. So I think this Nobel Prize is going to give inspiration to 20 year olds out there, 18 year olds out there. So this is fun to do. So I'm, I'm very thrilled about that. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so we have come to the end of this program. Uh, so I have Thanks, Siddharth, again for its wonderful talk. It's my, the time to thank everyone else uh, who was involved in this uh, in this event. So I would like to thank first the Infosys Science Foundation for their continued support for the cause of science and research. I thank the ISF team for their eye for details, which made this event a perfect one. Also, thanks to the members of CSSC of ISI Kolkata for their technical support. Finally, I would like to thank the Post Institute, the Indian Statistical Institute, for hosting this event jointly with Infosys Science Foundation. I hope this is just a start and there will be many more such events in the future. And also thanks to all of you for your participations. Okay, thank you. Thank you.